What is going on guys, I'm back again with another video and I know this year I really haven't been consistent with any of my uploads like at all. I'm working hard on changing that and hopefully soon we'll be back to weekly uploads fingers crossed on that one. So we recently hit 10k subscribers like a week or two ago and I'm absolutely thrilled. Thanks to each and every one of you for subscribing to channel 8. You guys have no idea how much I appreciate y'all. From here onwards the sky's the limit. I don't want to set out too many subscriber goals or anything like that because once we get there the goal has to keep changing. So from here onwards let's aim for the stars. We're going to the moon baby. I'm going to be working hard to get those weekly uploads in and keep you guys entertained to the best of my capabilities. And if I don't manage to entertain you then as always remember to hit that dislike button twice. As part of the 10k subscriber celebrations I thought I'd make a just for fun video taking a look back at all the cameras I've owned leading up to getting into photography and videography as well as the birth of this channel four years ago. Now disclaimer this channel did start off as a vlogging channel and hopefully that should explain some of the more questionable choices in my camera timeline. So let's go all the way back to 2014 where our story begins. A good friend of mine from high school and myself decided that we would start a prank channel so naturally the idea was to look for a camera with a long focal length so that the cameraman could record without being noticed. We settled on the Samsung HMX F90. This was a terrible 720p camcorder with a price tag just under $200. What wasn't so bad was the fact that it had a 52x zoom and a widest aperture of f1.8. <laughs> Who am I kidding? It was complete trash and I realized that the minute I pulled it out of the box. It felt cheap, had a tiny 5 megapixel sensor and really the 720p video out of it was just bad. Later that same year I decided to start looking into vlogging. This was at the heart of the Casey Neistat hype right when he was coming up and he definitely left an impression on me. I wanted a tiny camera that was so small that I could carry it anywhere without it feeling like a chore. I bought a Polaroid cube and now that I think of it this was never going to end well. What was somewhat an experiment ended up being just that an experiment. The Polaroid Cube is a small 1080p action cam, it has a tiny 6 megapixel sensor, 124 degree fisheye lens, it really wasn't anything to write home about. At such a small size you can obviously imagine that the image sensor in there was just minuscule. The mono mic was also terrible and it had no display so you could never really know what you're recording. Now look to be fair at about $90 at the time this was somewhat just a toy more than anything else. Think of it as a knockoff version of a GoPro. Regretted the purchase and barely ever used it. As a matter of fact I still have it to this day it's just sitting on my windowsill it's pretty much been there for the last four years. Okay moving on to 2015. So that prank channel evolves into something a bit more scripted as a comedy and skits channel. We dove straight into it and got a Sony NEX 5T and this is perhaps the first serious camera we got since I got into this whole becoming a creator thing. NEX 5T was an excellent camera. 16.1 megapixel APS-C sensor, 1080p at 60 frames per second, decent low light and a small rangefinder style mirrorless body. Honestly this camera was just amazing. I can barely fault it and this is a camera that launched in 2013. Just goes to show you how long Sony has been committed to mirrorless and how they've led the industry. I remember at that time it was almost impossible to find a camera with that sensor size and recording capabilities for the same price. I believe it cost around 400 to 500 US dollars in 2015. If I did have to complain about something then it It'd probably be the lack of a 3.5 millimeter mic input and an electric viewfinder but that's nitpicking. Overall the purchase was well worth the penny. Next up at the end of 2015 after having been inspired all year round by Casey Neistat I thought that it would be wise to look for a camera specifically designed for vlogging. Cue in the Canon Vixia Mini X or Legria Mini X for you folks across the pond. I do admit this is one of my more questionable purchases and especially when you consider that it cost me 600 US dollars. This was a weird looking 1080p mini camcorder with a 12.8 megapixel 0.4 inch sensor. It had a 160 degree fisheye lens with an aperture of f2.8. This is yet another one of my experimental purchases that weren't so great. As you'd probably guess the sensor was pretty small and the limitations of a fisheye lens were very obvious. It did do a few things right though. The audio was out of this world. 
the camera had dual 10 millimeter microphone elements that could record linear PCM at 16 bit. For those of you that don't know what that means, well, linear PCM supports a CD quality sampling rate of 48 kilohertz. The microphones were simply the best I've heard on any camera to date, and I'm not even joking. Another great feature was the form factor. It was tiny, you could literally just throw it into your pocket, and not to mention the flip screen, which was useful for vlogging. Overall, a cool camera, but at $600, it was more of a cool party trick than anything else, to be honest. I could never really make use of it for anything else other than just vlogging. Just a quick FYI, as mentioned before, believe it or not, Channel 8 started off as a vlog channel. And as a matter of fact, all of the vlogs I ever uploaded are actually still right here on YouTube, but I have them set to private. So yeah, that's a cool throwback. For those of you that will be interested in seeing those vlogs, I may be willing to publish them again. Let's make that the 100k subscriber special. Actually, let's make it 1 million because I really do not want you guys to see them. They are cringe as hell. Let's move on to 2016. And this was a really busy year. After deciding to go full force with the vlogging thing, I decided to get a drone and go all out and channel those Casey Neistat vibes. The drone of choice was the DJI Phantom 3 standard. I wanted something in the Phantom line since DJI was like the standard for personal quadcopters. I also wanted something on the cheaper end. Those of you familiar with the Phantom line will know that this is the line of drones that basically made a name for DJI as the go-to manufacturer for personal drones. Phantom 3 standard had a 12 megapixel 0.4 inch sensor with a fixed f2.8 35 millimeter equivalent lens. The drone could record 2.7k at 30 frames per second and at that time that really wasn't bad at all. However the joy was short-lived, I crashed the drone the very first day I got it which I documented in one of those vlogs I just mentioned. Now the drone still could fly but I quickly realized the limitations of using a drone as a vlogger and the difficulty of flying the drone while recording on the main camera. She unfortunately was forced into retirement after she self-landed in the water at the beach. Overall not a great purchase in the Sense that I barely ever even used the drone. Towards the end of that same month, I decided that I wanted a B camera that I could use for other vlogging stuff like time lapses in particular whilst vlogging. Enter the Sony HX60V, another one of my more questionable purchases. This camera had a 20.4 megapixel 0.4 inch sensor with a fixed zoom lens with an equivalent focal length of 28 to 780 millimeters. That's a 30x zoom. It wasn't a bad camera and I shot a decent amount of time lapses with it, but but this is perhaps the camera that I owned for the shortest time, I quickly sold it. This camera is what really got me started with venturing into sensor size and the importance of it. I was looking for shallow depth of field and with a 0.4 inch sensor and what is essentially a fixed kit lens, I certainly wasn't getting it. This camera also couldn't shoot raw, meaning that I couldn't really edit those time lapses the way I wanted and really this is the camera that also got me into shooting raw and doing my own edits. I had to of course get rid of it before I could do any of that. Overall, a rather wasteful purchase, I literally sold it a month later. Speaking of June 2016, right after selling the HX60V, I immediately upgraded to the Panasonic LX100 and I'll tell you guys one thing, that is perhaps the most definitive camera of my career both as a photographer and videographer. The LX100 had a 16.1 megapixel 4 3rd sensor coupled with a 24 to 75 millimeter equivalent lens. Now even though the lens was fixed, it was plenty fast with an aperture of f1.7 to f2.8. It recorded 4K video at 30 frames per second and could do 1080p at 60fps. In typical Panasonic fashion, it had some useful features like a built-in time lapse and stop motion mode. It had cool manual dials with such a satisfying tactile feedback and it just looked great. It's a camera that was and is an expression of art. Just thinking back and remembering this camera is literally giving me goosebumps. About 80% of all the videos on this channel were shot on this camera. This camera is channel 8 and it really felt like a part of me left when I sold her but it was time to move on. Later that year my dad bought me a Sony RX100 Mark IV for my birthday and I'm like talk about wrong timing, I had just gotten into the advanced compact market a few months earlier with the LX100. But anyway, a present is a present and so I couldn't not accept it. The RX 104 was a very expensive 20.1 megapixel advanced compact with a 1 inch sensor and a fixed 24 to 70 millimeter equivalent lens with an aperture of f1.8 to 2.8. And if you're thinking I've mixed up the spec sheet with the Panasonic LX100, no I did not. These cameras were roughly the same thing. The only difference was that this was now Sony's idea of a compact camera with advanced features. At $1,000 it really wasn't cheap either but it did have some cool features like the ability to record 100 
120 FPS at 1080p and super slow motion 240 frames per second at just under 1080p resolution. Overall, I never quite really fell in love with this camera. I think I was just so in love with the Panasonic LX100, so much so that I never really made use of or explored the Sony RX100. A fun fact is that the very first video where I ventured into photography and videography on channel 8 was the review of this very same camera. It still remains one of the most viewed videos on the channel to date. I'll link it up here on the video cards for those of you seeking a little throwback nostalgia. This is where channel 8 officially took shape. Now let's move ahead from this considerably busy but defining year to 2017. After selling my LX100, I was completely sold about Micro Four Thirds. I immediately started doing research, trying to figure out which Micro Four Thirds camera I was getting next. This time I wanted something more mainstream with interchangeable lenses as opposed to the LX100 which was a bit of a niche product. I settled on the Panasonic GX85 and I'll just start off by saying I never really liked this camera and it just didn't connect with me. The camera that I really wanted was the G85. But of course in typical Panasonic fashion, the GX85 and the G85 were technically identical inside but the G85 cost quite a bit more the usual excessive market segmentation from Panasonic. I ended up getting the GX85 simply because at that time in 2017, it was being sold at a huge discount and in a bundle from one of the online camera retailers here in Australia. For the same price I would have otherwise gotten the body and kit lens, I also got the kit zoom lens as well as a free Lumix 25mm f1.7. Not bad considering I only paid about 800 US dollars. Enough of that, the GX85 had the same version of the 16.1 megapixel micro four thirds sensor that was in the LX100, but I believe here it had its anti-aliasing filter removed. It could do 4K 30fps recording, had 5 axis image stabilization, and basically had everything the LX100 had, just slightly better. I actually did about 90% of my photography gigs on this camera. Great camera, but nothing really to write home about, and as a matter of fact, I quickly started to notice the limitations of Micro Four Thirds because of this camera, but we'll talk about that a bit later. Finally, last but certainly far from least, let's shift our focus to 2018, and of course this is the year that I purchased the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. I always felt that all my other hybrid cameras before this were never really outstanding at video and video recording features, and this is at a time when Channel 8 was growing and I was making more videos than ever. The Pocket 4 4K really needs no introduction, and if you're unfamiliar with this camera, then I highly suggest that you have a look at my official review video I did about a year ago in the top right hand corner because I cannot highlight everything. The spec sheet for this camera is quite comprehensive. We have a 12 megapixel 4 thirds HDR sensor. 13 stops of dynamic range and the ability to record in a lot of formats including Blackmagic RAW and ProRes in resolutions all the way up to 4K DCI and frame rates ranging from 24 to 120 FPS. It's the absolute real deal and at a bargain price. And again, for those of you that don't know what any of that means, I suggest you watch my full review video. This camera is what I shoot on today, it's what this video was recorded on and is what 99% of the videos on channel 8 will be recorded on going into the future. I absolutely loved this camera and one huge advantage for me at the time was that I could use my lenses that I'd already accumulated for photography on Micro Four Thirds. The image quality speaks for itself. If you want to shoot an indie film, do it on this. If you want to shoot music videos, do it on this. If you want to shoot high quality cinema grade videos, you can do it with this camera. So this is where we stand today in 2020. I currently do not own a camera for photography as I've sold my GX85 and looking to upgrade and move on to the next phase of my photography. After having shot with Micro Four Thirds for almost four years now, the limitations became apparent to me as a photographer. When I got my GX85, I thought that it would be noticeably better than the LX100 considering the two cameras were generations apart but it simply wasn't. The image quality was so similar that the only benefits of the switch was the ability to switch lenses and IBIS. It made me realize something. And don't kill me in the comment section for this one guys, this is simply just my opinion. Micro Four Thirds has reached its peak. This is the pinnacle of this technology. Even if I went with something more professional like the Panasonic G9, I know for a fact the image quality is not going to be significantly better than my GX85 even though it is a different sensor with more megapixels at 20 megapixels. Towards the end of my journey with Micro Four Thirds, I was constantly being reminded of the limitations in dynamic range, limited ability to crop afterwards due to low megapixel count, and not to mention the depth of field. With a crop factor of 2x, it is almost impossible to achieve that so-called full frame look on Micro Four Thirds 
standards without investing in some seriously expensive glass and at which point that background and foreground blur still won't be quite up there. And I know 16 megapixels or even 20 is plenty, but you get to a point where that just doesn't cut it anymore, especially when doing client work. I personally believe that 24 to about 28 is the megapixel sweet spot. But with a small sensor, I highly doubt that will technically be possible without degrading sensor performance on Micro Four Thirds. I've simply outgrown the Micro Four Thirds ecosystem. And please don't get me wrong, I've shot on many different cameras from Canon 80Ds to 7Ds and Sony A6400s and even Nikon D7200s, all of which are still crop sensor cameras. But spec for spec and apples to apples, I've been impressed with these sensors in these cameras and they definitely deliver superior image quality. Now one thing I have noticed though is that Micro Four Thirds lenses tend to be very satisfyingly sharp. I don't know if any of you with similar experience can agree with me on this one, please let me know in the comment section below. But for some reason, whenever I've shot on APS-C stuff from Sony, Canon and Nikon, I haven't been impressed with sharpness. And yes, a lot of the times I am shooting with top of the line stuff like the Canon EF 24-70mm f2.82, but the sharpness just isn't quite up there with Micro Four Thirds. I don't know, maybe it's just me. But anyway, APS-C is definitely looking like my next stop and my ticket looks like it has Fuji written all over it. Let me know what you guys think should be my next camera for photography in the comment section below. I really like the X-T4, it reminds me of the LX100, but at that price point, I can easily get into Sony full frame and start building my lens portfolio because eventually, sooner or later, I will be looking to go into full frame whether or not I go Fuji now. Going full frame now might end up being more cost effective for me and less of a hassle since I'll be forced to commit to an ecosystem early. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below guys. Thanks for watching and I hope that you guys enjoyed this throwback video. Please drop a like or a comment if you did and if you didn't enjoy it, make sure to hit that dislike button twice. If you're new to the channel then make sure you're subscribed and hit that bell icon to get notified when I upload new videos. Once again, thank you guys for 10k, catch you folks in the next one.